Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. The University of Vermont is recognizing four of its teachers with its top teaching award. Each year UVM bestows the Kreps Maurice Award to four individuals, one professor, one associate professor, one assistant professor, and one lecturer. The award is named after two families with deep roots at UVM and recognizes faculty for excellence in teaching. Keith Silva profiles one of this year's recipients. That kind of stuff is really important. Food James is, Jed Murdoch is a wildlife biologist and associate professor of the Wildlife and Fisheries Biology Program in the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources at the University of Vermont. He's been named as a recipient of UVM's Krebs Maurice Excellence in Teaching Award for 2017. Nominations for this award come from students, faculty, and staff. The award is given for excellence in teaching, outside the classroom learning, and innovative teaching methods. Each winner receives a $2,500 cash prize. Leopard. Well, oh. When Murdoch received word that he'd won, he was doing what he does best, working. I was just uh, finishing up grading, actually, and I uh, and, uh, got a very nice call from the head of the committee um, and was delighted. I mean, it's really a tremendous honor to, to receive this award, and I, I'm humbled by it, honestly. This is the only award that is strictly for teaching and student contact. So yes, it's a big deal. Joan Rosie Rosebush has chaired the Krebs Maurice Award Committee since 2007. I want anyone who is ever nominated to appreciate that someone thought that much of them to nominate them because that in itself is huge. And we've got so many faculty members who, every year, who, you know, we, we give it to one, one in each category. So professor, associate professor, assistant professor, and lecturer, and lecturer including senior lecturer. And there are years that we sit and we just read over the file again, talk it through, you know, maybe go observe the class a third time because we want to make sure that we are picking, for the right reasons, top candidate. Murdoch began teaching at UVM in 2009. He says it took him a few classes to learn that being a teacher means recognizing not every student learns in the same way. I just jumped into this role of the so-called sage on the stage. You jump up there and you, you broadcast and you, and you just feel like students will get it. And, and over time, you, you realize that, in fact, you need to you need to teach in ways that really um, identify with different kinds of learning types. And, and there's an art to it. There's definitely an art to it. When I was a student, we, we learned and interacted with the world differently. And the modern student engages differently. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, in the era of, of, you know, Facebook and Twitter and the Internet and so forth, um, they're receiving lots of information real fast. Uh, there are good, quick thinkers, um, and, and so you in some ways have to, you know, adapt learning style, ad adapt your teaching style to, 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 to this. As a wildlife biologist, Murdoch's work takes him far afield from the classroom. He currently has research projects tracking red foxes in Mongolia, and he studied wildebeests and zebra populations in Zambia. Closer to home, he's working with an undergraduate student, Lucas Beck, on a research study that uses trail cameras to catalog the movement of animal populations in Vermont. For Beck, this project so helps him gain the experience he'll need to pursue a career in wildlife biology. We have all these classes and kind of they're preparing you for research, um, but then it's a way messier process, I think, than sometimes it gets translated in, in the classes when you're looking at it after it's a finished pro product. And um, yeah, it's just been really valuable to actually be able to go out and see that process through from the beginning, hopefully to the end. Working one-on-one -on -one in the field with students like Beck or in the larger setting of the classroom, Murdoch feels responsible for the students who take his classes. 
one of the re most re rewarding parts of teaching to me, and I, I've been in it now long enough to see this, is, is to really be a part of the journey of, of students. So, you know, I've had several groups, you know, year after year, a new crop of students head out, and it's really personally rewarding to me to hear back from students and to see where they're at and to know that I've been a, a part of that experience for them. And, um, and that's just really, you know, personally satisfying and it's just, you know, great to, to know that we've got a lot of fantastic UVMers out there that are, are making a real difference in the world. Because when you're in that hostile situation, you're there to win. My goal is to get them out the door with the right knowledge, skills and capacities to be change makers. And, um, and the onus is really on me to, I think, adapt to, uh, you know, where students are at and meet them at their level and uh, work to make sure, again, that they're, they're out the door ready to be a, a fantastic agent of change. It's rewarding to know there are teachers like Jed Murdoch, difference makers who are quick to share what they know and never stop learning. In Burlington, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. UVM is also honoring three additional Kreps Maurice Award winners. Professor Rocky Lee DeWitt teaches in the Grossman School of Business. Assistant Professor Melissa Willard Foster is in the College of Arts and Sciences. And Catherine Bliss is a lecturer in the College of Engineering and Mathematical Sciences. Our congratulations to all the winners. Our next segment involves foraging through the forest. It's often said that the great outdoors is the world's greatest classroom. The outdoors provides plenty of opportunity for hands-on learning and discovery. For a class at UVM, the forest is the classroom. The students head to the woods to learn about some unique forest dwellers. Across the fences, Rebecca Gollin has the story. Where you find one, ordinarily you'll find a large number of them like this. Students from the University of Vermont are spending time in the woods. Like many Vermonters, they're learning the fine points of hunting. If they're lucky, they might even go home with something to put on their dinner table tonight. I think people understand that it's a living a living creature and that it, it follows some of the rules of of living things that they're familiar with but breaks other of those rules. These students aren't hunting fauna or even flora for that matter. Their prey is in a kingdom all its own. They're on the prowl for fungi. If you find edibles that's cool. I find it personally a thrill to find deadly ones just go like ooh. It is a little brown mushroom or an LBM we call them sometimes and uh, it looks sort of inviting in a certain way but this has the deadly amatoxins that uh, will destroy you know organs your liver and your kidney. I always teach people the poisonous mushrooms uh, before I start to teach them the edible ones. Terry Delaney teaches this class on mycology, which is the study of fungi. He says even students who are initially drawn by the prospect of edible mushrooms are fascinated by the incredibly complex diversity of the organism. They recycle carbon from fallen trees and other uh, material leaves. Um, and without fungi, um, all this carbon would pile up. But the fungi play a critical role in liberating that uh, fixed carbon into the soil, which can then be utilized by um, plants that come along later. In fact, about 80% of plants rely on partnerships with fungi. The class is a combination of lectures and foraging expeditions, and time in the lab to examine and identify what was found. Although many students do enjoy finding the edibles, the focus of the class is on biology and the role of various fungi in the ecosystem. They don't photosynthesize, they don't act like plants in a lot of ways, but people think of them as plants, so the mystery of not understanding how they work, I think, plays into their interest in culture. One of the coolest things about mushrooms is each one can have a lot of different purposes, and there's so much diversity in it. It's like one you can use, like you can draw on it, like the artist conch that we saw, or you can use the you know shaggy mane to draw with, or some mushrooms are used to like start fires. There's all sorts of different uses for them. So what's so fun about uh, studying mycology is mushrooms come in all shapes and sizes, and they're everywhere in nature. Ann Hazelrig runs the UVM Plant Diagnostic Clinic, 
where she helps commercial growers and home gardeners identify and manage insects and disease. Many of these diseases are caused by fungi. Winter oyster, we've got the luminescent uh, pinellas. I think mushrooms are fascinating. Mycology is fascinating because we encounter them in all parts of our lives. We eat them. They're in our breads. They cause our breads to rise and beer to ferment. And uh, they're used in drugs, you know, helpful drugs, and um, cause plant diseases. So it, it, they're a fascinating organism. Hazel Rigg is taking the class to learn more about the disease side of the organism, also looking, and also uh, to get more familiar with identifying a, uh, fungi in general including the mushroom she found on the way to this interview. What's this one that you have here? Well, I don't know. I just found it. It was growing in mulch, and I have no idea what it is. So I'll take it up to the lab, and I'll get a spore print and take a look at the spores and try to go through a key to figure it out. I feel like mushrooms don't always get the respect they deserve. And, Carrie uh, Oster is a self-professed mushroom nerd uh, who joined a local mycology well. society uh, when she was in high school. Spot, now that she's a plant biology major at UVM, learning more about how fungi fit into the forest ecosystem will help her understand what's going on. There's a lot of variations on this in terms of size and dimensions. And you can learn like, oh, this mushroom is growing on this tree, but this kind of mushroom only infects already dead wood, so you know that the mushroom didn't cause the tree to die, or just when you find a log that's on the ground and some of the shell fungi are growing at 90 degree angles to each other, you can kind of tell by the mushrooms when the tree fell over. It's a lot of fun too. When you get out in the forest and you start to uh, notice these things, uh, often you'll sit down and start to look at a mushroom that you just discovered and after immersing yourself into the environment for a minute or two, you realize there's two or three others within arm's reach. It's certainly not too hard to find several species of fungi within arm's reach. While there are about 10,000 named species of mushrooms, scientists estimate that 80 to 90 percent of all the fungi on Earth have not yet been named or described by science. And even locally, uh, no doubt there are some undescribed species, but uh, locally we, we certainly have uh, many thousands of species uh, of mushrooms that, uh, that could be found. And uh, I would say that uh, just estimating there are several hundred that are common. This semester we've seen you know, several hundred for sure. The abundance of species can be seen back at the lab with the wide variety of mushrooms the students have gathered. I found some oyster mushrooms, also the winter oyster, some amanita mushrooms. I found a winter oyster and that's the only one that I know what it is yet, but uh, the rest of these we're going to be micro IDing microscopically by looking at the spores and uh, also by going through the keys and looking at the macroscopic features. The students will each gather and identify a collection of about 15 different fungi. That will involve spending some time in the lab looking closely at identifying features. So what is it that you're looking at? On the a few things. Most importantly for identifying the mushrooms, it seems to be the spores uh, seem to have the most characteristics and that seems to be the end all for uh, for what something is, is if you look at its spore and its characteristics, that can make or break your ID. Well, it's not edible, but it's, uh, it's spectacular. Usually you find it way high up in a tree. So Several like businesses around the state are cultivating edible mushrooms, and the popularity of local food has led to an increase in foraging. Delaney says that all of the attention just adds to the interest in fungi, which can lead to fruitful results. You could study fungi for a lifetime and still be learning things at the end of your lifetime. Ann Hazelrig says the class has expanded her appreciation for the subject. I find that, you know, whether I'm on a run or walking in the woods, I'm always kind of looking down to see what, what I see, and that's fun. So it's a, a way to connect with nature, I think, you know, so I, it will be a lifelong learning thing for me. I saw something, an off-color brown in here. Huh. From the woods to the lab, these UVM students are in search of answers. With its many mysteries, the complex world of fungi will be worthy of pursuit for years to come. In Burlington, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Thanks, Rebecca. And that's our program for today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.